I have now owned my W210 for 10 years, and I wanna make this video going over what it's been like owning this car for the past decade. So this video is probably going pretty long, so I will try to put chapters down below in the description so you can skip to the part you wanna see. I'm gonna to try to organize it in a couple chapters, something where I'll go over what had to be done to this car since my last update video, more about the car, like the car's history, and at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about me for those that are interested. So this video is filmed two years after my last ownership review video, which is my eight year ownership, so now this is 10, two years later. I haven't really driven the car a whole lot since then maybe two or three thousand miles so if you want to know what driving a lot of miles on this car over a long period of time go look at that video i probably gonna cover a lot more maintenance than i do in this video because it really hasn't been a whole lot done to this car in those two years and because i don't drive it not a lot has gone wrong with it i got this car january 31st of 2014 it is now 10 years later and i put about 60,000 miles on this car and since my last update video which i think we were at 198,000 miles or 199,000, we are now 201,800. not a lot of miles since the last update video the first three years of this car, it was my daily driver. So that's why I put so many miles on it in the beginning and not now. I'm lucky that now I can kind of just retire the car and just have it kind of be my fun weekend project car. This car was such a great daily driver for me. It never left me stranded except for one time where the battery died and that was no fault of its own. The previous owner had a laser jammer installed in this car that was always on. So I drained the battery. But after I removed it, it solved all those problems and this car has been super reliable. So in terms of mechanicals, what this car has needed in the last two years, really has not been much. I've just been changing the fluids. So of course I've been doing my old changes pretty regularly. I did the power steering, which I was kind of slacking on. I did the coolant, the brake fluid and the transmission and diff, they were still fairly recent and clean. So I didn't do those. You should definitely keep up on fluid changes because that's the only thing that will really kind of hurt this car. If you neglect to do the fluid changes, that's when stuff starts to go wrong. That's when you're gonna need major mechanical items like the transmission replaced. Same thing with the engine. If you keep clean fluids in there, clean engine oil, clean coolant, you'll be fine. All right, so since my last video, the engine bay is looking a lot nicer. And in the previous update video, the valve cover gaskets were leaking and it was really obvious it'd be smoking all over. So since then, I have replaced the valve cover gaskets and I did not do the most proper way to do them. When you do the valve cover gaskets, you're supposed to reseal these breathers up top with the Mercedes black sealant. And I did not do that because they were not leaking. They were probably due. It had been a couple of years since I've last done it, but since they weren't leaking, I was going to skip it because the valve cover gaskets are actually a fairly quick wear item. But when I first did them, they only lasted about a year and a half. I don't expect these to last super long. So by the time those need to be replaced, the breather still might be good. So I'm gonna just kind of roll the dice with that. Same thing along with the hoses in the back. There's a couple of thick like vacuum lines that go from the valve cover to the air inlet. I did not replace those because they were still good. One item that really needed to be changed was the oil cap seal. So this is a fairly neglected part. Mine was completely gone and it would leak from the oil cap down from the filler neck all the way down to the valve covers and that did not look good. And of course, then you can't tell what's leaking so since then i have replaced that and now it is nice and dry and in fact i did not really clean this engine well when i had the valve covers off as you can see there we still got some oil stains from when they were leaking so i definitely need to up my cleaning game on this car but you really can't tell unless you get your head in there so what's obviously been replaced since the last video are my washer tanks so i thought this would look really nice there's nothing wrong with my washer tanks so i think i mentioned in my last video the washer pump will start leaking over time it's down below this container right now it's kind of stuck so i'm not going to pull it out but you go in there and there's an o-ring you can get a generic o-ring i think it's a number six or seven from lowe's and you could just stick it on there and that fixes the leak the only reason i decided to replace the washer tanks was because I think they just look better brand new. Mine were really faded, ugly, and yellow. Since then, as you'll notice, I did not connect the connector because it's empty. So honestly, I don't know what I'm waiting for. I could totally connect and fill some fluid in there, but I just left it empty for now since I don't drive this car that much. And speaking of windshield washer fluid, so depending on how clean you want your tanks to look and stay, you may not want to fill it with windshield washer fluid. The reason I say that is because once you put like anything that's colored in there, it stains it and it helps it yellow and fade quicker. What I'm going to end up doing is put some distilled water in there and that's it. I'm just going to have just straight distilled water. And since I don't use the windshield washer fluid a lot, it's not going to make a big difference. Of course, depending on how you use your car, you you should probably put windshield washer fluid but for me i'm going for aesthetics here so that's why i'm deciding to do that another thing that i replaced was the coolant expansion tank so this actually does not look as bad as the washer tanks do when they fade this does turn a little yellow but it's not super obvious so i could have actually rolled with that but i decided because i did these 
that kind of looked out of place so i decided to replace it anyway and now we got a brand new coolant expansion tank which i think looks really good it makes the engine pop a little bit more so unfortunately when i decided to do that i had to undo that hose to replace it obviously and i damaged that hose i was leaking coolant from that hose right there i had to replace that hose as well as one more when i was down here they were old they were kind of due so i decided to do it all at the same time and then when i did that i did the fan shroud because my last one cracked and it was also incorrect because i'm running the amg airbox i have to have this different hose that goes all the way down to the radiator i also had to swap out the radiator and that requires a different fan shroud because the other one will go all the way and kind of interfere and the fan shroud is just a whole different shape so i replaced it with the correct one and now everything looks better so now the only tank that's kind of out of place is the brake fluid reservoir that's kind of still a little yellow however when you put clean fluid in it does help improve the appearance i should just replace it but we'll save that for another day another thing that i did is that this hood pad is in two sections so you got the main one there and that one over there so this little small section in the back is actually specific depending on which car you got so one for the e55 with this air box is shaped different to accommodate for it so when you shut the hood it doesn't touch this part is unfortunately no longer available so you can't buy one new which is really unfortunate because these tabs that hold it in break as well as the little standoffs that hold it to the hood. So I had to improvise here. So I got a bunch of double side tape underneath holding it up as well as these washers to kind of help hold it in place. And it's been fine ever since. So I ordered some new screws and I switched them from Phillips to Torx. I got some washers and now it's holding it in place and it hasn't moved since. So I'm really happy that I did that. Unfortunately, this is just kind of what you're gonna have to do as parts continuously go out of stock and they're not gonna bring them back. You're gonna have to kind of adapt and kind of make what you have work. Another thing that needs to be replaced is this upper hood pad it's kind of stained it's kind of dirty it's not in the worst shape i've seen much worse but this is not brand new i do have one for this car i haven't put on yet but now these are no longer available as well so i'm glad i got a couple when i did so that will also improve the appearance of the engine bay i'm not sure if i mentioned this in the last video but i also did have to replace the hood release cable i did a whole separate video on that i didn't film it on my car i did it on my car kind of as like a trial run and it's actually not too bad but most of these cars will need a hood re release cable eventually it is this size that the sheathing of the hood release cable expands and it prevents the cable from releasing the latch all the way so it prevents the side of the hood from closing i've also seen people say that their hood release cable snaps from the inside so their hood is stuck shut so that's something that you should do if you're having trouble popping your hood or if your hood is having trouble closing so in case you're wondering how would you open your hood in case you don't have access to the inside if you get a car up in the air go underneath it remove all the under paneling and crawl up underneath there's just barely a big enough space to kind of reach your arm around in here or grab a hook or something and release the latches from the underside it's not something you really want to do so i would recommend replacing your hood release cable if you have any symptoms of any problems just take care of it right away before they become worse so if your hood release cable is functioning properly your hood should easily shut when you drop it from a low distance like that so now mine is fully shut it is not loose at all so if yours is not like that i recommend replacing it another thing that i've done under the hood that has also improved the appearance of the engine bay is the windshield wiper seal so that seal is pretty common they all disintegrate so i replaced mine which requires removing the wiper assembly and taking it apart so that's not a super simple job it is doable i didn't film it unfortunately but perhaps in the future i can film it but it's really not that bad it just takes probably two hours to do going slow and trying to be careful having the right tools makes all the difference and the hardest part is just aligning it so unfortunately when i put it back i was one spline off so once you use a wiper blade and it comes to its rest position it kind of shifts one spline over when you're not using it you can't tell so i'll address that in the future but since i barely use it anyway it doesn't really make a difference to me i did also replace the cowlings here under the hood so i'm not sure if i covered that in my last video but these are super simple it's just one phillips bolt and they slide right out I did mention earlier, but I replaced the fluid in the power steering reservoir. So on the 124, the power steering reservoir has a filter in there that's interchangeable. On the 210, the filter is actually built inside of the reservoir. So if you want to change the power steering fluid filter, you'd have to change the entire reservoir. I did not do that. The fluid wasn't that dirty, so I'm going to roll with it for now. But at 200,000 miles, it probably would have been a good idea to change the entire reservoir. I also forgot to mention that when I did the coolant expansion tank, because I had the system apart that required me to drain all the coolant, and because I had to go back in there about two or three times to fix all all the leaks i did end up draining and filling the coolant three times that kind of got the system pretty clean and the coolant is nice and blue there's no cloudiness to it so it's always good to keep your fluids clean more than the recommended interval that really makes a difference in terms of having the engine last a long time 
I think initially Mercedes recommends like 10 or 15 years. That's way too long. I've also seen it where they say every five. I probably stick to every five, probably less. I probably do it every two years. Having clean fluid doesn't hurt your car. It just costs a bit more money. It's kind of a gamble depending on how well your car was taken care of before you got it. If the fluids have always been clean, there's just generally a higher chance of it not needing anything major internal. In my last video, I mentioned that there's really only one catastrophic failure of these M112 and M113 motors. It's the only thing that goes wrong and it's kind of more of an age thing. Although I do think that depending on how well the car was taken care of and how it was driven, it may affect the longevity of these parts. But there is a O-ring that sits on the front timing cover, which is only accessible if you take the heads off of the car or the upper and lower oil pans. It's a very involved job and those O-rings will fail over time, causing oil and coolant to mix. This car never has head gasket issues. It's always that that will cause oil and coolant to mix. Or if you have a car with oil cooler, which in the US, that would be only on E55s. The oil cooler seals will also fail and cause that issue. However, generally with oil cooler, it will be an external leak, not an internal leak. If you got your oil and coolant mixing, then you got a big job ahead of you because you either have to take the heads off the car, which I do not recommend. That, that job is really involved and kind of sucks and really doesn't need it. Or you could pull the engine out of the car, which does definitely require a lot of effort and space and time and tools or whatever. Then you can remove the upper and lower oil pans, reseal it, and that also gives you opportunity because you're going to separate it from the transmission to do the rear main seal, which is also kind of like common on these cars. But depending on the car, some of them don't really leak that bad on mine. I really haven't had a good chance to look at it up close because there's so much oil leaking from my valve covers. I couldn't tell what was leaking, but when I leave this car sitting or when I drive it, there is not a single drop of oil that goes on the ground. So I really don't think my rear main seal is leaking, or if it is, it's just seeping ever so slightly so that's something i'm going to roll with i'm not going to replace immediately but my main point i was trying to make which i know i kind of got off topic there was if you have clean engine oil in it frequently clean coolant i think that will really help prolong the life of those o-rings so you won't have to do such a major repair but considering that that is the only major job that this car needs in 20 years that is a big improvement over the m104 and the m119 the m119 m104 will require generally more work especially the 104 those will require full head gasket because they just fail prematurely the 119 are a bit more reliable than 104s but they do have their issues as well with the timing chain guides these m112 and 112s are really robust and in my opinion they just require a lot less maintenance to keep them going so in case you didn't know 1998 was the first year of the m112 and m113 engines so if you have a 96 or 97 you have a 104 inline straight six or the m119 the v8 which is a dual overhead cam 32 valve motor this m113 is a single overhead cam 24 valve motor so it is a little bit more simple and uh, if you go look online on the forums people were complaining back in the day that this is a very neutered version of the 119 that mercedes was forced to make for emissions those guys will have their opinions but there's really not much of a power difference in fact i would say it's practically imperceivable between same displacement m119s and m113s it might be kind of a personal preference thing but the m112 and m113 are simpler there's just less stuff in them in general and in my opinion they're easy to work on and they just last longer needing a lot less work so in case you're deciding which one to buy i definitely recommend the later years in my opinion the 01 and 02 are the best ones because of the later ME 2.8 computers. So the ME 2.8 computers allows you to use more modern diagnostic software as well as opening you up to doing more engine swaps or transmission swaps because the car can be coded so much easier. And that's not to say the older cars from 2000 and earlier can't be swapped, but it's just more involved. And speaking of model years, 2000 was the first year of the facelift, but they still were using the older engine electronics. So there's slight differences between 2000 and 2001. A frequently asked question that I get that I will cover in this video is my engine. So this is the stock 4.3 M1 13 that came in the car this is a 2002 e430 so they would not have this engine cover and this air box so it just have this single inlet from the side which the e320 would also have and while it does look like this air box simply bolts on that's not really the case it is a bit more involved than what it looks like i'll quickly go over what it took so in order to get this air box to fit on your 113 and in fact i think this also fits on a 112 it's just that the front engine cover won't clip on this is actually a full dual air intake that goes from both sides so it's not just for cosmetics it does serve a functional purpose like i said the stock air box sits here and it has one air in the from there this is completely blocked off this has nothing here it's just completely empty on a 320 and a 430 so the first thing you're gonna need is a radiator because this hose will go up right here where this air inlet is you'll need the e55 amg radiator that has the inlet on the bottom so you have to run this hose as well this is a different hose which has another hose that's sticking out of it to go here so you also need a different hose going from the coolant expansion tank the coolant expansion tank is the same it's just you need this hose which comes with this little t fitting
everything and you'll need this hose which is a part of the entire hose right there next up you will also need this scoop right here so this scoop kind of sits in between the radiator support that helps hold this air hose additionally you will also need the e55 amg specific brake booster hose that goes all the way here and curves around the air box to fit into the back of the intake manifold the 430 and 320 hose interfere with this so this is something you will need and i think this is still readily available another part you'll need is also the fuel hose that goes from the body to the engine. Unfortunately, this part is no longer available, so this is kind of really hard to get. So you'll have to get one off of a parts car or make one yourself. You can go to a shop that specializes in creating hoses and crimping hoses, and they can actually make you one, but the factory one is no longer available. This is required because the original hose also interferes with the airbox. So if you have a 320 and 430, your mass airflow sensor sits right here. You will also need to extend the wire to the mass airflow sensor, or in the case of the M113, you can swap over the E55 AMG engine wiring harness but that's a very big expense so you're better off just extending the wire because you will have to relocate your mass airflow sensor right above the air inlet which you'll also need a specific elbow so we'll see that's the mass airflow sensor right there and then underneath is the elbow so you'll need the one that's specific to the e55 amg we'll see mine's really dirty because i did not clean up when i was working on the car there's my extended wire i also got lazy there i should have wrapped it in the black tesla tape to make it look factory i did not do that but that is what it requires to fit this air box so the air box will fit no problem everything lines up and the only issue is on us cars there's no engine oil cooler so i did have to kind of make a little tiny cut to the engine cover section to accommodate that but other than that that's all it took and that's the only difference you could tell between a 4.3 and a 5.4 and 113 another minor difference is the oil filler neck the 55s won't have the extension it will just go straight to the valve cover i decided to keep my extension i kind of like it and it also kind of helps me when i'm filling oil into the engine so this is definitely kind of something that's like 50 percent cosmetic and 50 percent functional it does help having dual air inlets instead of single so you get more air into the engine i'm not sure how much of a difference it makes i just think it looks really cool and it's definitely a neat trick when people think you have an e55 and it's not you can definitely see how their attitude shifts when they find out it's not a real amg Another thing that requires is the lower hood pad section, which I mentioned earlier. So another thing that I've done up in the front since the last video is a lot of LEDs. I was already running the ASEAN Optics LED City Light. So in addition, I now have the Oxido LED High Beam and the Oxido LED Turn Signal, which I really think that makes this car a little bit more modern. And honestly, having better lighting output is also beneficial to safety. And I think it just looks really cool. So I did do separate videos on the LED High Beams and the Turn Signals, but just a little demo. We'll see, nice and bright instant to on and off i really think that every two ten should have these i just think it makes the car a whole lot better but of course everyone has their opinions you can leave it original that's totally up to you also another thing that i've done is the led side markers this is kind of like a mixed thing for me i don't really like aftermarket side markers on this car the clears especially look awful to me but because this is smoked and it kind of matches the black i could kind of roll this on my car and i personally like the fact that's led so that is why i'm rocking it otherwise i do like the color matched side markers so you just get them painted body color and they look good and on Honestly, long run, I might just switch to Euro impact strips so this entire piece will get switched out and this will be completely blank and this chrome will go all the way over and there will be no side marker. That's how the Euro cars have it. Another thing I did to the front of this car since my last video is replace the clips on the grills. So these AMG grills have specific clips that hold them in place. Mine were broken and worn out and this thing was barely held together. I'm lucky I didn't lose any of these grills, but I got new clips, got new screws, and it is now attached and holding on much better than before. So super happy about that. Another thing that I replaced is the clips to these roof rails. So mine were worn out and mine were sticking up above. They were not sitting flush. So I decided to replace those and now it is sitting nice. Uh, I do need to get these refinished again. They're not perfect, so get them redone and put them back. But now it is sitting so much nicer than before. There's a big gap right here. And now this is sitting pretty much as flush as possible all the way through and it was sticking up. So that's something that I had to do on my car. Another thing on the exterior is the Euro aspherical mirrors. These are aftermarket. There's a line right here and there's like a kind of a blind spot mirror over here, which allows you to see more. I did a whole video on this. So if you're interested, check it out. But these I think are a worthwhile upgrade because you just see so much more and it's easier to drive in my opinion. Another thing I change is the inner fender liners. So it's this part that's sticking down and goes all the way around, all the way to here. This car, when I bought it, the previous owner put 20 inch wheels on it which did not fit on this car they're way too big and the wheels rubbed and destroyed the fender liners 
especially this upper portion right here. So this entire piece right here was missing. So I decided to finally replace them. That job actually wasn't so bad. The worst part is you have to kind of remove the side skirt from the front right here, which these clips are super fragile. So you just have to be super careful about that. But otherwise that was definitely worthwhile doing because it just makes the whole car look better. They're faded, they're gray, and they're supposed to be black from factory, nice and dark. You're supposed to barely be able to see them like right now. But mine were gray, they stuck out and look bad. And missing this piece, I always notice it. Your, your car is supposed to have this little piece sticking down. Mine never did. I'm really happy that now I have it. So on the face of W210, there's like a little gasket that sits between the side skirt and the fender. So when I had my car painted a couple years ago, I had the fronts replaced, but I did not do the rears. And I finally replaced the rears, which I'm glad I did because now one side of these is no longer available. So you can't even get one side from the factory anymore. So on the back, just basically the same thing as the front. We did the LED turn signals. I believe I had the LED reverse lights, which I also did a separate video on that. But the back is pretty much unchanged. I'm still running the LED license plate light housing. So that's an entire different piece of plastic that has LEDs built into it. There are places the factory ones and I tinted them. So I'm still running those. Another update too is I found this genuine AMG period correct license plate frame with a fake carbon. So this is like a factory accessory that the dealer would offer and has a period correct AMG logo, which I like as well as the fake carbon. Another thing that I did was I replaced these cowl vents. When I had my car painted, they were not resprayed properly. So I found a set of original black ones, polished them up, put them on, and they look much better now than the previous matte black. So I think that was definitely worthwhile doing. So it also required finding a brand new insert piece. All the clips that hold it to the hood were broken. That part is also now no longer available. So it's just these little things that make this car nicer because previously these vents were kind of coming up. The clips were totally like destroyed. So now everything is stable. It stays where it needs to be and it looks good. So I think that pretty much sums up everything it did on the exterior and the engine bay so if you notice that's pretty much all cosmetic there really wasn't anything majorly mechanical almost everything i did was to enhance the look of the car but nothing was really super necessary and that's just kind of how i like to keep this car as looking as good as possible so interior wise, since the last video, I have the headliner installed. So when I filmed the last one, we were still in the process of redoing it. So now everything is completely reupholstered and installed and the way it should be. So this is genuine Alcantara, the same material that Mercedes uses. And this is the anthracite material, which is also the factory color that newer cars use. So I was able to find someone that had the resources to get it and install it really properly. We paint all the plastics to match and I think it turned out really nice. When I see a lot of people when they do Alcantara, they don't paint the plastics and they have this gray, all this stuff is gray. So it's kind of two-tone and I don't like that. I think it should all be painted to match and look as factory as possible. And this car really should have come with Alcantara. The E39 BMW M5 came with it and there's really no reason this car should not have come with it. But now my car has it and I'm super happy and I would highly recommend it to anyone. It is expensive, it is labor intensive, but if you like your car, I think you'll like this material. I did a whole video documenting the process of this headliner. So if you are interested, check it out. It is on my channel. It's pretty long and detailed. So if you have a question about the headliner, I probably answered it in that video. So another thing I'm gonna count for the interior is the key. I still have the original style key. I don't know if this is the actual one that came with the car, but this is what they would look like if you bought this car new in 2002. So I did replace the shell with a nicer looking shell and this one's already getting worn. I found another shell. These are getting really hard to find now, especially genuine Mercedes. You have to buy a real one. So these are really hard to find, but they do pop up every now and again. And I added the Mercedes, they call Brussels keychain. I think this is a really nice keychain. It has a star on it, really nice key ring. I think it looks super 2002, really pretty correct. This is something I wish I did sooner because I was just running some tire keychain, which I didn't really care about, but this FA makes the car feel a lot cooler. Another thing that I did, which you can't really tell unless I open up the ashtray, is we got a little microphone there. I added Bluetooth to the factory auxiliary port. If you have the command unit, you'll have an auxiliary port in the glove box. So my car still going to replace this glove box at one point. And luckily they swapped over the key so I could still lock it, but they did not use the correct glove box with the cutout for the auxiliary port. Mine is actually located underneath the glove box. Uh, that kind of worked out in my favor because now I have that full Bluetooth solution completely hidden away. It's wired to this lamp right here which allows it to turn on and off with the ignition so now whenever i turn on the car my phone will automatically connect to bluetooth and i can play music and i could take phone calls and this microphone picks up audio pretty well the people i've called with it have said that my voice sounds pretty clear and you could totally have a phone conversation using this microphone and the bluetooth streaming solution a whole video detailing the entire process of that if you want to replicate it on your car is totally doable and parts are pretty cheap i think everything was less than 50 bucks another thing that i did which you should also do if you decide to do the bluetooth because they require 
requires removal of the glove box is the cabin air filters. So when I first got this car back in 2014, I ordered some cabin air filters and replaced them right away. I haven't changed them until probably a year and a half ago and they were disgusting. They were overdue. Definitely don't wait as long as I did. I probably change them every year or every two years, but uh, I got some aftermarket ones which have a built-in charcoal filter, which I think is really cool. Although this car doesn't really need it because it has a separate charcoal filter located underneath this little panel right here. And if your W210 has this button right here, that will activate the charcoal filter, which is separate from your cabin air filter. Now that I have cabin air filters with built-in charcoal filters, I won't have to use that. And if I do, it's even more filtering, which is a benefit. All right, so let's do a mileage check here. 201,874. Pretty high mileage for this car, although not a whole lot of miles since my last video. I really have stopped driving this car in recent years. And I purchased this car 10 years ago with about 140,000 miles on the clock. So I did end up buying a new key, which of course, if you buy a new key for this car, it's just later style keys that the new cars come with. But another thing that I did to this key is put new batteries in it. It's super simple. And that kind of made a difference. Now this key has better range and the ignition doesn't get stuck. So sometimes when I would stick it in the ignition, it wouldn't want to turn. I think that was just because there's not enough power in the key to give the information to the ignition. But now not a single problem since I replaced the batteries. Everything just works. So I did have the LED lights on the interior in my last video. So since then, I filmed a video showing how to install them and where to buy them. So if you are interested in that, check it out. So since I don't drive this car a whole lot, I just leave the seat covers on here. It does protect the seats, which I do like. But uh, since the last video, I did leather the seats, which kind of made them nice and soft. So hopefully this will help preserve them. And luckily it didn't affect the dye too much. There's some maybe spots where it got a little light, but overall I think it was worth doing because the seats are so much softer now. And I feel like it definitely adds some life into these. Leather Reek has collagen in it, which helps soften up the leather. If your leather is old and hard, I recommend doing it as well as applying the G Technique Leather Guard on it, which will kind of help preserve the dye if you have colored leather like mine. But that's something that I do recommend. And uh, I did it on the seats, the door panels, because it does have the Napa on the bottom, the steering wheel, the airbag because that is leather, the armrest and the shifter, and that made a huge difference. The leather is so much softer now. I hope the leather reek and leather guard added some years to the leather as well as preventing it from cracking or tearing. So here is the back, a really nice view with the Alcantara, the red leather. So nothing is really different in the back. Now we just have a headliner in place, which before it was kind of taken apart and looked a little bad. So I think that covers all the changes that have happened to this car since my last update video. As you can see, it was mainly just cosmetics and just taking care of the car, cleaning it up. And in fact, the car is really not that clean. So obviously exterior wise, I do wipe it down. But on the interior, I have not vacuumed this car in probably at least two or three years. It is pretty bad. Luckily the seats are fine and all that's fine. It just mainly needs a vacuum and maybe cleaning the carpets a bit, but I don't let this car get too dirty. I just get a little lazy here and there. I think it's crazy that this car is now 22 years old. So this is a 2002. This is the final model year of the sedan. So this car is produced October, 2001. So in fact, it's over 22 years old. So 10 years ago when I got this car, I was only 12 years old. And back then no one really cared about W210s. They definitely didn't get any attention from Mercedes Benz or anything like that. It wasn't a classic car. It was just like an old used car. So think about a 12 year old car today. So that'd be now a 2012 model year. So think about like a 2012 E-Class. That's kind of how this car was back in 2014, which I kind of dislike that. Now that this car is starting to get attention, I just think it's ridiculous it was ignored all these years. This is such a great car. It is so well built and is nothing like the cars today. Back then, if you had a E320, E430, or E55, the build quality was consistent among all of them. The materials, all of it was really high quality. Although this car is in great shape mechanically and cosmetically, it still does need some stuff. I've been kind of neglecting doing some of the major mechanicals in the past couple of years. I've just been focused on other things and other cars. And honestly, I just haven't been driving this car so much. So the stuff that I've let go don't affect this drivability too much. So I would say that the stuff that I've let go, which I'll go over shortly, really have made this car not ideal to drive very hard or for very long. So that's why I kind of take it easy when I drive this car now. I don't really drive it a whole lot when I do. So for example, I've been averaging about 100 miles a month on this car. So the item that is most affecting the drivability of this car is the front flex disc. So if any of you have paid attention to my previous videos, you should remember that the front one is starting to show some signs of wear. Obviously the rubber on the flex disc is damage and starting to show some of the insides. It is actually not horrible. It sounds pretty bad when we talk about it, but it's just one particular section of it that's bad. So it does obviously need to be replaced. I do have the parts on hand. I just haven't had time to replace it because I want to do some more stuff while I'm up in there. So obviously I'm going to do the front, I'm going to do the back, and I want to do the center support. It's just all those things are 
probably around the same wear. So it is a good idea to replace all of them at the same time. And on top of that, so anyone that has a really sharp eye for this kind of thing should be able to see that my engine sits lower than it should. And this wasn't actually super apparent to me until I parked my car next to my friend's car who just had fresh engine mounts and the engine sits noticeably lower on my car. So the motor mounts are definitely collapsed. They are worn out. They are not so bad to the point where I hear the engine clunking around when I accelerate. Granted, I've been taking it pretty easy on this car, so I don't want to make it worse than it is. That is something that needs to be addressed soon. And when you do engine mounts, you should do the transmission mount as well. They just wear it together. And honestly, the stock transmission mount is a little flimsy. So it's just a good idea to do it while you're up in there. On top of that, while I am doing that stuff underneath the car, I will have access to a couple things that should be replaced just because of age and because I don't know when the last time they were replaced. One of them being the voltage regulator on the alternator. So if you don't know what the voltage regulator is, it does exactly what the name implies. It helps regulate the voltage coming out of the alternator. So when that goes bad, your alternator will not be charging your battery. And so oftentimes when the voltage regulator goes bad, people misdiagnose it as a bad alternator. And that is not necessary to replace your alternator. Most of the times you could just replace the voltage regulator, which you can access through the back panel. It's actually pretty easy to do. It's way easier to do than an alternator. That's something that I'm planning to do because I definitely have not replaced it in the last 10 years. And who knows when the last time it was replaced, but it's just a good preventive thing to do because that will drain your battery and cause your car not to start. And speaking of causing your car not to start, a somewhat common thing in these 112 and 113 engines is the crank position sensor going bad and that will cause your car not to start. It will crank and crank and it won't start. And people usually freak out about that, but most of the time it is gonna be the crank position sensor, which is located somewhere down in there. It's really hard to see, but once you pull off the air box, it's actually really easy to see. It's not super accessible, but it is definitely doable from the top. Uh, you can also do it from the bottom. When I have the car in the air for motor mounts, I'm gonna be doing that as well as a voltage regulator. Luckily, my car has not exhibited any symptoms of not starting, but just because of the age, it's a good idea to just do it as preventative, and then that way it'll be good for a long haul. As far as things under the hood, my spark plugs are at about 50,000 miles, so it really wouldn't be such a bad idea to change them. They are kind of ready to go 100,000. Changing them every 50,000 wouldn't be a bad idea. That's something that I'm considering doing. However, if I do plan to swap the engine which it will not be a 5.4 liter m113 naturally aspirated then i don't see any point in doing that so i'm not sure if i'm going to do that so that takes care of what needs to be done under the hood so i mentioned the transmission mount i'm going to do a trans service and i should probably do the conductor plate luckily my car hasn't experienced any issues but a conductor plate is kind of a common thing that happens in the 722.6 transmission it prevents the car from shifting and so people think their transmission has gone bad but oftentimes replacing the conductor plate will fix it it is a electronic plate that controls the transmission and it's internal so once you drop the pan you have access to it i just want to kind of do that as preventative next up while we're underneath the car this car is definitely due for a fuel filter i don't remember the last time it was changed so i'm going to do the fuel filter and probably the pump the car is not exhibiting any signs of those being bad but at this age and me not having any documentation showing when it was last changed i think it's a good idea just to do it as preventative just so this car is good for a long haul and the final thing that i do want to change out on this car is the rear multi-link suspension just all the suspension arms in the rear i have no idea when they were last changed i've never changed them and usually they last a long time but we're at 200 thousand miles at 22 years old it's time to change them so those are the things that i feel like this car needs to be 100 percent i've done most of those things to my 124 and my 124 drives amazing doing that stuff to the 210 will get up to speed on maintenance it'll make it drive as new as possible and be good for a long haul which is kind of my goal i want to get this car to the point where it doesn't need any major mechanicals all it needs is fluid changes which is kind of what i've done with the 124 this car literally needs nothing except oil changes and i want to get the 210 to that shape and it's not there yet and all these things are kind of minor but when you add them up i think the cost of parts is around $1,500 to $2,000. So it is kind of a big bill. I'm probably gonna be doing most of the work myself or with the help of friends. I wanna group as much stuff together as possible to do it as quick as possible, which is why I'm kind of holding off. Doing all the drivetrain might take a day. Doing all the multi-link in the back might take another full day. We'll see how I plan that out, but that is definitely something that needs to be done. And doing the multi-link in the back will require an alignment. So hopefully I can schedule everything to get it done in one shot and just have one alignment visit and then we'll be good. In terms of the cosmetics, the exterior is only gonna get some new wheels, which they won't look too drastically different, basically be the same thing but they will be two piece they'll be made by bbs i think they'll look really nice so i'll run the same tires same tire sizes so not a drastic difference but my plan is to put these wheels on my future wagon another thing that i would like to do if i do have the extra time and money is the euro trunk lid so basically it's the same as the us except the cutout is specific to the euro plate so it's much wider so if you look at the e60s rear that's the trunk lid i want it's completely pointless it's just purely because it looks cool and then that's kind of like a euro thing on my car which no other car in the us would have unfortunately it's not as simple as my 124 was where i can actually just replace the lower section i have to replace the entire trunk lid and get it painted if i can make it work out or if someone can help me ship it then that'd be great as far as the interior goes i think i'm going to do some stuff with my door panels i did not recover the fabric right here in alcantara which i decided not to do it because i thought oh it's already black and it's actually in really good shape none of this is coming off now these cars that are 20 plus
plus years old. These are peeling off. Mine are in really good condition. So I think I'm going to have a set of these lower plastic pieces recovered in Alcantara to match my headliner. It'll look really cool. And along with that, I'm going to do the handles. So this is just covered in vinyl. It's not leather. I'm going to have these done in Napa leather to match this lower portion of the door panel. My matching ruby red steering wheel, I think will, I will also replace it with a wood one. I managed to find a period correct AMG steering wheel. So it still has these bolsters and a little grip right here for your thumbs. It does have a different wood trim on it. It's wood and leather. So I'm going to swap out all the wood trim to match. So I'm currently piecing together all that stuff. Hopefully I'll get that that refinish it all so it matches and put it in so that'll kind of be a lengthy process because i've never done it so i know all four door panels have to come off the dash is probably going to suck but i will get it done i also have a matching wood shift knob so i don't know if i'm going to put that in but i also managed to find a red leather one so hopefully that red leather matches so we'll see i don't know which one i'll run i will have option between wood and leather this is just a factory black another thing that i've been collecting over the years is parts to retrofit cooled seats so my seats are actually cooled and the way you can tell that these seats are cooled is if they have these vents in the back so both of mine do these are factory cooled seats and in my entire ownership i've never gone to use them only the heated part which is still really nice but i've always wanted to retrofit the cooled seats and now that i have the switch panel and the wood trim i have the wood trim both for this wood and the wood that i want to swap to so now all i need to make these seats work is the harnesses that run from the switch to the seat and luckily i have the diagram it's really not that complicated if i have to make it myself but i can find a factory harness that has a much better solution so that's something that will hopefully come pretty soon another thing that i'm considering to retrofit because i've been collecting parts is folding mirrors so no us cars got folding mirrors i'm talking about the electric folding these mirrors do not fold manually either but you will need to get entire new mirrors so you actually need to get the mirror frame so you can reuse your caps but the thing that actually holds the mirror to the car you'll have to swap with the one that folds uh, i do have a harness a factory harness that makes everything work and i do have the switch so all i really need is the wood trim panel with the cutout for the mirror which would go right here and all i need is the mirror frames for the right and left mirrors which are actually findable i can get them used as long as they're not too damaged once i get all that i will have folding mirrors in the car this is something that i really want to do but i'm not sure if i can we'll just have to see but it'll be really cool if i do another thing that i'm considering doing as well is the door release handle right here i do have a set in black i think they'll look really good in black once i do everything else so that's something that i'm considering doing another thing that i'm going to do to this car is retrofit some sort of magnetic phone holder it will go right here it's going to be using the cuda branded mount it's like a little extension of the dash that will go right here the way that it mounts it's not supposed to damage your dash though there's no holes that need to be drilled so it should just kind of add itself right here i want to figure out how to put a magnetic holder that uses magsafe to be able to hold an iphone possibly retrofit wireless charging i think that'd be really cool so i'll have a phone right here being held by magnets and charging and it should look really seamless it should look like it's a part of the car it shouldn't look too out of place and that's something i want to do to this car as well as the wagon because the wagon will be daily driven this car should have it too because i think it'll be really awesome to have a place to put your phone another thing that i do want to do is a rear sunshade so the factory did make some accessories that sit on top but now there's some aftermarket solutions that cover the corners way better so perhaps in the future i'll be able to get a set and i'll show you what they look like that's something that'll be really cool because i do have the factory rear sunshade so all that will match really well another thing that i hope to add which i could totally do right now if i want to is this amg door sill plate this is a pre face of one so it kind of goes up all the way if i had a face of one it would just stop right here however i do like this one because it goes up all the way to the top this is a refinished piece these come in stainless steel this is redone in matte black i think it looks really good this was a factory offered dealer accessory this was made by the factory however it was never installed on any car you would have to purchase this separately so not many cars got these they do offer aftermarket ones but these are real ones that i had redone i had these since 2017 i've never put them on that's something i do want to do in the future so that pretty much covers most of my future plans for this car my goal is to get this car completed in its naturally aspirated form and then that's basically where i'm going to kind of stop if i ever get around to a new drivetrain swap which will be really cool i do want to do bigger brakes which hopefully my wheels will clear that's not something i'm planning for right now so i'm not going to dive deep into what those plans are this car has been really great to me and i do recommend the w210 for those that are interested however i'd like to point out a couple things uh, this car is really not for everybody anymore it is at that age where it's starting to need a little bit more attention and not many shops they take it to are qualified to work on it anymore they just either really don't care they're really careless and many of the specialized Benz shops kind of don't want to work on them anymore another reason too is that parts availability is getting worse over the years of course mercedes-benz does not support these cars at this age it's both too old and too young for them to really care about it it's, that, it's at that weird age where parts are going out of stock and they're not coming back so if you want to own one of these cars and keep it looking as fresh as possible it's getting much more difficult to do it's going to be really difficult to find 
fine parts and anyone that's owned a 124 knows how difficult it is and just gets worse over time luckily with 3d printing and more people being interested in these cars that helps kind of get reproduction parts produced so unfortunately with some parts there are scarce people who have hoarded them are selling them for exorbitant prices and that's a topic i'm going to discuss in a little bit it's pretty unfortunate that owning this car is becoming more difficult over the years i would consider a w210 kind of an enthusiast car at this point if you don't really love the car a lot of stuff is not going to make sense to do there are some common failures of this car like the headliner if you take it somewhere professional to re get redone it is kind of priced high so not everyone wants to spend the money to make their car look 100 percent so i have seen through various cars at this age like for example the silver e55 my friend got that not many people and not many shops are qualified to work on these cars so while we're repairing his car we're seeing some really shady work some incompetent work some really hack work so that's unfortunate that a lot of people they just don't care they don't have the right tools they don't have the right knowledge even though most of this stuff is readily accessible online that people just do kind of really bad work to these cars screw them up more to where it's just better leaving it broken so i do definitely recommend if you decide to get this car get some tools get some decent scanners and be ready to learn and work on the car yourself it's just way better than taking it to a shop you have no idea what they're doing to your car they could totally be subletting the work and charging you more and having someone that's not qualified to work on the car or they have whoever their entry level employees work on the car it's kind of scary to think that a lot of shops get away with this stuff but it happens all the time and i'm seeing it more and more often there's just people that don't take pride in their work and i of course would never recommend taking this car to a dealer for any reason the dealer is the least qualified of anyone to work on this car the young technicians that the dealers hire fresh out of uti or just entry levels that come from somewhere else they really have no business working on this car i would not even trust them to put air in this tire granted that's most of them not all of them there are still a few good seeds out there same thing with the older techs the older guys that have been there a while that know what they're doing they're qualified to work on them but a lot of them are leaving the dealers at this age so it's just unfortunate that the amount of people that are trustworthy work on this type of car is diminishing more and more every day which is why i recommend working on this car by yourself as much as possible it's just you could take the extra time to be careful to clean up really put the extra effort in that this car deserves to look good all right so now i want to address a question that i get kind of frequently now this is my absolute least favorite thing to get asked about these cars and that question is what do i think these cars are worth what is the value of these cars is this car a good investment let me just first start off by saying if you buy this car for anything other than personal enjoyment and the fact that you like the car i don't think you're gonna have that much great of a time just because if you're just chasing those numbers that's not an enjoyable way to own a car i think that's absolutely absurd i bought my car back in 2014 for 3800 bucks you could consider that a good deal whatever i don't really care i've never looked at the value of these cars i don't care i don't track it i think it's stupid to track it just think i got a car that i enjoyed and i like spending time and money on and that to me is something you can't put a value on and to me that's all that really matters is i enjoy the car i like it i like being in it this is a car i really didn't mind being stuck in traffic with i didn't mind taking anywhere so that to me is what makes this car so special so it is unfortunately no secret that the value of these cars have been rising over the years and i am not a fan of that i think cars appreciating in value is not a good thing for the general public these cars are becoming less and less accessible not that the e430s are expensive but the e55s are getting there and the problem i have with that is the price of the car goes up but the quality of the car continues to go down the car you buy today for 10 15 20 000 is not a good quality car that you would have bought the same price for five years ago or even less than five years ago it is absurd when a car with 150,000 miles that has noted rust that has faded wood that has a bunch of problems that has not had the proper mechanical items addressed on the car that does not drive like new goes for fifteen thousand dollars we used to beat people up for saying things like that everything's all topsy-turvy now i think that's so stupid so i will continue to root for these cars to depreciate i hope they don't appreciate i think if i were to enter the market today for an e55 i'd have a very hard time getting one and i think these cars being accessible to people that want them is a good thing it's not a bad thing so a problem with that logic is of course with these cars being so cheap they ended up in the wrong hands and that is why they are kind of in the bad shape that they are today both cosmetically and mechanically they were cheap horsepower at one point and people just bought them to go fast abuse them and dump them which is why a lot of the cars today are kind of not so nice and my rebuttal to that logic is also that the people with money also don't know how to take care of these cars. I've seen people that they clearly can afford this car and they take it to high-end shops, but those shops don't know how to work on it. There's really no winning here. Not a lot of people want to work on the car. Not a lot of people want to work on the cars themselves. And the fact that it goes up in price doesn't help actually preserve the car. I feel like there's a lot of middlemen making commission selling this car and it really sucks, but that's just the state of the world we live in. It is the same issues as going on with housing, which I don't want to get too deep into like other issues with the world. But like, for example, a house that appreciates more than triple in value over 10, 20 years 
is not beneficial in the long run to anybody. That's how a lot of these big corporations end up buying these houses and renting them out. So someone that really wants to own a home can't own one. I don't think corporations own cars, but that's just kind of what's going on. The cars are going up in value. They're getting harder and harder to own. And what ends up happening is they go on these auction sites and these people are selling these cars for way more money than they paid for. And it's just, it's an endless cycle of this car going up in value and the quality of the car not going up. So you end up paying 15, 20 plus thousand dollars for a car that needs 10,000 plus dollars worth of work. Even though if you bought a car that's ten thousand dollars or less it needs pretty much the same amount of work of course maybe the mileage is lower but like i said mileage doesn't really affect these cars it's just overall condition above everything else so if you follow me on instagram you probably know i do not support any auction sites especially the brand specific one i despise them all i think they're all awful and they're just degrading these cars more it's they're literally defiling these cars that's how far i would go but the problem is with these auction sites people kind of take their word for it the car's always underrepresented people hide something the sellers hide something and the auction site doesn't really do anything to verify anything about the car at all of course it's by your own risk but these cars for some reason people think because it's on that certain auction website that it's a good quality car and that is not the case oftentimes the cars on auction websites are cars that are being flipped they are bought cheap put the bare amount of work to make it sellable and then they sell them for big profits so that's why i will never support any auction website and if you ever see me support one clearly i've sold out those are my beliefs so I still highly recommend trying to find these cars from classified ads. My favorite still is Craigslist to this day. A lot of original owners still sell them there. Facebook Marketplace is kind of okay, although a lot of dealers go there. OfferUp is another one. And honestly, I really wish the forums had died out with social media, but sites like MB World and Ben's World and the other forums that are specific to the brand, those are honestly the best places to buy these cars. But of course, they're getting used less and less. If you really wanna know where to find the best car, go on Craigslist, find one that's been sold by the original owner or the original family of the owner and that is honestly the best place to buy one of these cars for the best deal so hopefully i addressed all those questions i try to go over it the best i could with what i believe because i just recommend if you buy a car you really should be buying it just because you like it not because you're trying to make a big profit off of it all right that pretty much covers what 10 years of owning this car has been like and i hope you found it helpful if you have any questions please feel free to leave them below for those of you that have been following me for a while i've been on instagram for eight years i've been doing youtube for three and i've had this car for 10 if you've been following me that long maybe you want to get to know me so so for this last part of the video, I'll tell you a little bit about me and the car. I figured it's finally time for those that have been following for a while. So first, let's start with some introductions. Never actually formally introduced myself to anyone unless you met me in person. My name is Armand. If you were to spell it the way you pronounce it, it's A-R-M-A-N. I'm from Orange County, California, born and raised here, lived here my whole life. And that is kind of the reason why I call it SoCal 210. I am from Southern California. I have a 210. I figured it sounded good. It was short. So that's the name I chose for my profile. So let's start with my history with the W210. So back in 2007, my dad got one. He got a, I believe it was a 2001, it may have been a 2002, E320 four Matic wagon. It was desert silver over the tan MB Tex. That car was immaculate. He bought it from the original owners who purchased it new and they did Euro delivery on it, which is awesome. So luckily they took really good care of that car. It was in better shape than when I got my car. And so in my opinion, those are the type of people you wanna buy a car from, the original owners that took good care of it, which is unfortunately becoming harder and harder to do every day. The reason they were selling the car was because they got a 211 wagon. At the time that car was fairly high mileage it was in really good condition and when my dad got it i thought it was the coolest thing in the world it was so high tech that was like a five or six year old car back at the time that was like the newest mercedes we've ever had because up until then we had a 190e it was a 93 that car i was really fond of i really liked it and in fact i, I liked it so much i kind of wanted that to be my first car uh, that car unfortunately was an accident so we got rid of it and when the 210 came along i thought it was like the biggest upgrade in the world the car was much bigger it felt way better it was like super modern we never had a car with an electronic key that you could lock and unlock the car from factory so i thought that was cool the steering wheel buttons i thought were out of this world they work so well back then we were still use a six to cd changer i thought that was amazing and the little details like it did not have the orthopedic seats but it had the little thing that stops stuff from falling down in there i thought that was amazing that's such a simple yet clever thing like every car should have that the cup holders were really cool although uh back then they didn't work really well and of course today they don't and today they break really easily his wood was immaculate it was super dark not a single mark on it it, that thing was like in perfect condition. I thought the Bose sound system sounded amazing. He had the Singleton radio with, with the little storage compartment. I thought that was awesome. The climate control was amazing. And he had heated seats, which that was the first car I ever saw with heated seats. No Xenon headlights. But that car was amazing. I thought the tan looked really good on the gold, although I'm glad my car came with black interior. I was never such a big fan of 040 black, but it's really grown on me over the years. And I'm kind of fond of it now. His car also had the factory 16 inch wheels and they were chrome. Now I learned how chrome wheels actually work. I'm not a fan of chrome, but back then I thought the chrome wheels looked amazing. My dad wasn't 
wasn't fond of them. He wished they were silver. Uh, it was a 4Matic, which back then was pretty high tech, and the car drove amazing. The 4Mac definitely does change the driving characteristics of the car. That car was super clean. My dad took really good care of it. The engine bay was way cleaner than mine, even today. It had a couple little imperfections here and there, which he corrected, and he cleared out the garage, parked it inside. He really took pride in that car, which I really admired. I'm glad that was a car he enjoyed. We went out with it a lot, and that's a car I have a lot of fond memories with. So seeing my dad with that car, I wanted to get a W210 when it was my time to own a car. I was really hoping he would keep his car long enough for me to buy it off of him, but unfortunately it was having the rear SLS issues and he didn't want to deal with it anymore, so we decided to sell it. So I found this place and the best place to buy a car, which is Craigslist. Uh, we met the guy. This car really wasn't that great and I really wasn't super interested in him, but I made a lowball offer and somehow he accepted it. And somehow I convinced him to deliver the car to my house. It kind of worked out. Like this was actually not a bad car. He was the second owner. The first owner owned it for almost 10 years. I think now that I've owned it for 10 years, I've owned this car for the longest period of time throughout all the previous owners. And that's kind of a joke that I kind of tell myself is I'm trying to be the first owner of this car. The first owner probably kept this car the nicest. The second owner definitely did most of the damage to this car. I'm trying to fix everything to the second owner did to this car i wish i could have bought the first guy but that's just how it worked out i don't think i would have bought this car if he didn't accept my offer so this really wasn't the car that really spoke to me and said this is the one it was just kind of a good deal and i kind of rolled with it it was cool it came with the sport package so it had the amg front bumper side skirts and the rear bumper which actually was technically sport there's no exhaust cut out and felt black on black looked cool and it had heated seats it had xenon headlights that command it had the rear sunshade it had a decent amount of options it came with some big xix 20 inch wheels which were aftermarket not my style he included the stock 16s which this car is supposed to have the sport 17s and those are missing but i got a set of the amg style threes which i really like i really enjoyed this car kind of just as is for the first couple of years i didn't really do too much to it i thought it was a great car all i did was add a little battery powered bluetooth auxiliary port thing to it and i just rolled with it why is this car so special to me if it wasn't all that spectacular to begin with that's because i spent my formative driving years in this car this is a car that i got my driver's license with this is a car that i drove to high school school to college my first job i spent a lot of time in this car i spent a lot of time learning the roads with this car just going out and exploring southern california so i have a lot of memories with this car which is why it is so special to me this is the same car that also got my interest in mercedes spark and also the same reason why i decided to learn more about cars in general it's kind of become a hobby that i take too seriously but it's something i really enjoy i really enjoy learning about mercedes and this car has led me to meet a lot of really cool people and got to see a lot of really cool cars a lot of really cool w210s even though owning this car has gotten easier for me over the years because i learned so much in the beginning it was definitely very hard there was stuff i did not know how to diagnose one of the first challenges i had with this car when i owned it was that it drove so smooth and then one day the steering wheel would shake and no matter how many times i got the wheels and tires balanced it still shook i had to diagnose that the front lower control arms are bad that was very difficult to do because i just had no idea but that definitely took a lot longer to fix than it should have but now that would be something super easy for me to diagnose i definitely have had my fair share of frustrations with this car and at one point i was actually pretty mad this car i posted it for sale funny enough and had a couple people come to look at the car and honestly if they would have given me my asking price i probably wouldn't have this car today so i'm kind of glad i kept it because my goal was to sell this car and get a 211 back then you know i thought it'd be cool get a 211 it's a newer car get an e55 it'd be a big jump up in power i'm really glad i didn't because the 210 i believe the whole chassis is superior obviously the m113k is better but we might do something about that in the future over the years i ended up addressing some of the problems that this car had and i made a list of everything i wanted to do to it kind of like my dream list i didn't think i'd be able to accomplish most of it because a lot of it was just so expensive and i had no idea where to take my car in for certain stuff like paint somehow i got a lot of that stuff done looking back now i wouldn't think that was possible before i didn't think i was going to be this interested in the car and for lack of a better word invested i don't think cars should be invested in yeah like after a certain point it just became fun to you know make this car the way i wanted it to be funny enough like i had this car in high school i was just dreaming of putting certain parts on it and now I'm able to put those things on the car. It's kind of like a childhood dream come true, which is funny because like a lot of people look at 210s like absolute buckets, especially in Europe, they're taxis and they're prone to rust. But nowadays they're kind of getting more respect. I didn't really care about what other people thought. I just really like this car. So one thing that this car has taught me is kind of about people. Clearly I put some expensive parts on this car over the years. I put some AMG parts on the car that's not an AMG. And that kind of really shows people's true colors. People really do worship the badge, which is unfortunate because they're really blindsided by like this kind of 
have elitism with having an AMG and not having an AMG. It's funny enough when you think about AMG back in the day that they put a lot of body kits, interiors, and non-performance parts on cars like the 124 and all the previous cars since they started. It was really an aftermarket tuning accessory company. And another point to make on that is that these cars are just so similar and they're so well built, which is not a bad thing to say that they're so similar, but they're so well built. These parts are interchangeable. So having like AMG body kit on like E320, E430, whatever, it bolts right up. There's no reason not to do it. If you like how it looks, why shouldn't you do it? Same thing with the wheels, same thing with the interior. They all bolt up, everything plugs into place. It's, it's really not that special of a car in a sense. But yeah, a lot of people have criticized me saying that I'm wasting my money putting all this effort into an E430 or whatever. Those have generally been the people that I'm glad I avoided because their way of thinking is really just, in my opinion, stupid. Like, why wouldn't you put money into a car that you like and enjoy and put parts on it that you like? And they're saying, why didn't you just get an E55? Well, I probably would have back in the day, but it just ended up working out this way. And I was really keen on having a two-tone interior. I actually really wanted the black and white. And it was just really hard to find one with that interior back then. And then when I discovered the red, I really had to have the red. And luckily I found the interior and it was actually a really good price. So I put that interior in my car and you know, I have the parts I want on it. Now, of course, being an E430, it is slower than E55, but it's not like such a drastic difference. It's like, it is a difference, but it's not like such a drastic difference. The car still has a lot of similar characteristics. I'm not out here chasing horsepower. I'm not here out here chasing speed. If I want a fast car, I wouldn't have a 210, like straight up like these cars. Yeah, they're pretty quick for what they are. They were fast back in the day, but in modern times, if you want to go fast, get something else. This is not a car you should be chasing power and performance for. This is more of a well-rounded street car. It's about comfort. It's also a little bit about performance, but that's not the main goal. It's unfortunate that people really get blindsided by the badge worship and the power chase. I mean, come on, we're in the streets. Like I'm not racing this car. This is a street car. I'm never going to track this car. It's just a car that I enjoy. I just want to take on a nice day out just for a fun drive and just enjoy the day, enjoy the weather, enjoy the car. That was my logic behind how I built this car. I have no desire to get rid of the 210 or the 124 to replace them in another car. If you pay attention, then you know I really do like the CL55 AMG compressor. That is a car I really do want, but that is a car that I am not willing to swap out for one of these. I really do want one. If I have to pick and choose, I'm keeping what I have. I'm not selling them. Of course, like having a faster car is super fun. Every time my friend lets me drive a CL55, I lose my shit. I love that car. That's probably my favorite coupe of all time for Mercedes. There's just something about these cars. It's kind of a time capsule in a sense, like not that it's in like super museum condition, but you know, I have all those memories with this car. It takes me back to that time era when my dad had his 210. And the 124 really reminds me of our 190E we had in the early 2000s. We went cross country from California to North Carolina in that car. I was in that car for a lot of my childhood. So this car really takes me back to that, which is why I really have no desire to get rid of either car. So yeah, that's kind of the history about this car, a little bit about me. It's been so awesome to share this passion and hobby with you guys. It's been so awesome to connect with all of you. Some of you have been sending me some really nice messages through Instagram or through email. I really appreciate all of them more than you'll ever know. This car has really allowed me to meet some really cool people and I hope to continue to share this passion with you guys. If you follow me for a long time, I appreciate it. I, I know with some of you, we've got to talk through Instagram messages, some of you through email. I appreciate all the support. So hopefully this last part of the video where I got to share a little bit about myself in the car was kind of cool for those that were wondering. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for your support and we'll see you in the next one.